England's villages. Thatched cottages, neatly tended gardens, the village pond and a good pub lunch. It's a cosy chocolate box image that's recognised across the globe. I'm Ben Robinson, and as an archaeologist, I'm fascinated by the places where we live and how they've evolved over time. For me, the story of our villages from Norman times to the present day is not one of sleepy rural idylls, but a story of purpose and power. And we can see this here, deep below the Derbyshire Dales. In 1771, a wig maker from Lancashire saw an opportunity. Water, running from lead mines deep under Derbyshire's hills. But Richard Arkwright didn't just see water, he saw energy. Enough energy to transform the small village of Cromford forever and start a revolution. It not only changed industry, it changed rural landscapes across the world. What emerged was a totally new kind of village, and one that represented a seismic shift in the way that we lived and worked. Today, people come to Cromford to experience Derbyshire's beautiful countryside and to discover the story of Sir Richard Arkwright, the famous industrialist who mechanised cotton spinning and started a textile revolution. Cromford became a new kind of village, engineered to service the enterprise of this ambitious man. When Arkwright arrived, there was nothing here but a few scattered cottages. Over the next 20 years, he shaped the village we see today, complete with pubs, a market, shops, new streets that could house a large workforce. And at the heart of it all, Arkwright built his grand cotton mills. On the face of it, it's an unlikely place to put an industrial village, but it's no accident that Arkwright chose this rural location. Water draining from Derbyshire's hills and lead mines offered him exactly what he was looking for, power to drive his new machines. He had what he needed to mechanise cotton spinning. This is known locally as the bear pit, but actually it's a very clever piece of hydraulic engineering. The machines in Arkwright's factory turned raw cotton into cotton yarn. And to do that, they needed a constant supply of water to power them. Now that sluice could be closed, driving water along an underground passage into a mill pond. All that happened on a Sunday. On a Monday morning, the water would be let loose, powering up the factory again. It would drive Arkwright's revolutionary spinning machine called the water frame. By the time Richard Arkwright had built his second mill in the village, he's mechanised the spinning process. The raw material entered the building at one end and left as finished cotton yarn, ready to turn into cloth. The business methods Arkwright devised in Cromford took the Industrial Revolution to a whole new level. Arkwright had the power, he had the machines, now he needed the workforce to operate them. There weren't nearly enough people in this rural part of Derbyshire, so he had to attract them into the area. And not only that, he had to convince them to work and live in a totally new way. Before Arkwright's factory system, textile workers laboured from home. People moving to Cromford had to be willing to work in a factory and give up the management of their own time to mine someone else's machines. But Arkwright could offer the promise of regular work and wages. This is absolutely fascinating. It's an advert placed by Arkwright in the Derby Mercury of the 10th of December, 1771. 
and he's saying weavers residing in this neighborhood by applying at the mill may have good work. There is employment at the above place for women, children, etc., and good wages. Then ever the practical man, he's got at the bottom, a quantity of boxwood is also wanted. The advert did the trick. No doubt many workers were attracted to the idea of a better life. Historian Emma Griffin is a specialist on the Industrial Revolution. We've got to be very careful not to romanticise life in the village. The people living in rural England in the late 18th century are very poor. There's not much work for women and children, so there's just a male breadwinner in the household and wages are really very, very low. We know that a lot of children are going hungry, um, living in the countryside, so this was a, you know, it, it, it looked like a good opportunity for people in the context of the time. And we've created something here that's a world beater and that must have been important to the economy. It was absolutely fundamental. Most historians would think that the development of the cotton industry really lies at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Now, at peak production, there were 800 people working in this mill complex, 24 hours around the clock on a two-shift pattern. Imagine the noise, all that machinery going, all those people, the water rushing. It's pretty noisy these days. I dread to think what it was like back then. Although we don't know for sure, it's thought that single men were housed in barracks next to the mill. But as the workforce grew, families needed homes and there weren't enough houses in the village. Offering better than average homes was all part of Arkwright's grand plan to attract workers to move here and stay for good. So during the 1770s, construction of North Street began. The architect is unknown, but no doubt Arkwright had a big say in its design. Adrian Farmer is a historian of the Derwent Valley Mills. Adrian, Arkwright is an inventor, an industrialist, but pretty soon he becomes a housing developer yeah, as well. Absolutely. He needs to fill uh, that mill with workers, so he's got to find a way of bringing people in to do that. And the best way of doing it is to provide really good quality accommodation for them. He borrows £1,000, he's not a rich man yet, uh, so he, he then builds 27 very fine houses. Uh, and th these two terraces are those, those uh, houses that were provided for those workers. And this is something completely new, done to Arkwright's principles. Absolutely. It's a world first. It's industrial housing. It had never been done anywhere in the world before, providing workers for an industrial reason. And that then was copied down at Belper, uh, further down river, but also Colebrookdale. Across the world, it started here. Back in the late 18th century, terrace housing was really new. And North Street was built to a very high standard. There are details here like these leaded lights, the sash windows, the classical echoes in the door surrounds that you generally find in middle class housing. This place was inspirational and it definitely inspired people who'd come from much humbler dwellings. And it inspired other industrialists who built villages for their workforce like Victorian Saltair in Bradford, and the row upon row of back-to-backs that became a familiar sight in every British industrial city. Although Arkwright had mechanised the process of spinning cotton into yarn, that yarn from the new factories was still woven into cloth by weavers working from home in the village. Ah, here it is, the original long window. This let light flooding into this, what was a workshop area. And it was up here that the skilled weavers, the skilled framework knitters would sit, beavering away all day at machines like this, churning out products from Arkwright's yarn. Cloth for clothing, stockings, all the profits going back to Arkwright. Records of early inhabitants are hard to come by, but according to the 1841 census, one family who lived here were the Britlands. Charles probably worked from home and he lived with five other females, his wife Elizabeth and a baby only 10 months old. With just one bedroom and one living room, it would have been a squeeze for a family of six. Houses not only tell us about how people lived, 
but also the social structure in the village. The higher you climb the career ladder, the better your home. These three-storey semi-detached houses are believed to have been built for the overseers or factory foremen. They offer a bit more space. There's a few more architectural details on here. No weaver's workshop on the top floor and your own privy at the back. This was something to aspire to. There's a number of these properties up and down the street. But if you want to take a real step up the property ladder, how about this? This is the mill manager's house, and it's a real statement of authority and control. Polite Georgian architecture, but it's situated right in front of the main entrance to the mill. And you can imagine William Seddon, the first mill manager, casting his beady eye on that entrance, trying to spot any latecomers. The way people lived and worked was changing. There was a new social order in the village. A working class community was born and in charge of them, not the established gentry, now it's new money. A wealthy industrialist calling the shots. To extend his power, Arkwright bought a local country estate and later bought the title Lord of the Manor. This gave him status and rights over Cromford's citizens. He chose the finest residence in the village, Rock House, as his home. Now, Rock House was later extended and then converted into apartments, and now it's almost hidden from view. But back in Arkwright's day, this building really stood out, and it's said that Arkwright could keep a watch over his factory from his office round the corner. Before long, he began to build himself an even grander home, Willersley Castle, designed by architect William Thomas. By now, Arkwright was highly successful with mills in Lancashire and Scotland, and this grand residence on the hill overlooking the village fitted his status. This was Arkwright's showpiece. As the son of a tailor, he was acutely aware of his own humble origins and also acutely aware of the grand houses of the aristocracy surrounding him. He obviously felt he needed to live in a house that reflected his growing status. This building was to be a display of power and wealth. Arkwright the commoner would finally take his place in high society. But England's elite were unimpressed. Viscount Torrington called it an effort of inconvenient ill taste. Clearly, he thought it expressed the low cultural standards of this nouveau riche entrepreneur. Those are very harsh words, in my opinion. But the point is this. The new industrialist posed a threat to the status quo. Only the aristocracy should have homes like this. And Arkwright's bold new business venture was also a threat. What if the people that came flooding into this area caused problems? What if they lost their jobs and became a burden on the parish? Before Richard Arkwright's water frame came along, textile workers had felt secure in their jobs. They were considered craftsmen, producing high-quality cloth. With mechanisation and cost-cutting, the balance of power shifted, away from the independent worker and towards the big factory owner. In 1779, following riots by stocking makers in Nottingham, cotton workers target Arkwright. A mob descended on his mill in Lancashire, burning it to the ground. In Cromford, you can see Richard Arkwright was obsessed by security. Machine breakers and thieves weren't his only worry. He was also keen to keep out commercial spies. Emma, as we step into the mill yard here, it's like stepping into a castle yard. I mean, these, these buildings are like the curtain walls of the castle. We've even got a fortified gatehouse here. I think that's right. I mean, a lot of early factories don't look like this. We've got to remember that this is kind of built at a particular point in time. 
Arkwright's concern at this time is riots and looters and, and damage to his property. There have been riots up in Lancashire at the Burkeacre Mill. They ripped down the water wheel, they've raised it to the ground because they're very concerned that this new technology is going to de-skill them, take away their skills, their good quality jobs, and replace them with women and children who'll be working in the factories instead. So Arkwright's key concern at the moment that he's building this is keeping those kinds of protesters out and keeping his very expensive uh, new baby, his technology, safe from outsiders. Cromford was shaped by the growing demand for cotton, and in 1783, Arkwright built an even bigger mill on the edge of the village, half a mile away from the first mills. Masson Mill was by no means his largest, but today it's considered his finest surviving mill. Grand and groundbreaking, it harnessed the power of the River Derwent. Masson Mill was built with some architectural flair. Look at those Venetian windows, the lunette windows. And it was built of brick, which was becoming highly fashionable at the time. But it was also a strong building. The walls are two foot deep and the floorboards were three inches thick to support the weight of machinery. This building became the blueprint for many cotton mills across the north of England and some of its features were copied in mills as far afield as Germany and North America. In fact, the secrets of Arkwright's spinning process were stolen. They were used to kickstart the industrialization of the young United States of America. German industrial spies even had the audacity to call their new mill, near the town of Dusseldorf, Cromford. The Derbyshire mill owner couldn't control international rivals who copied his ideas, but in his village he controlled everything down to the last penny. Arkwright controlled the currency in Cromford. With a national shortage of silver coins, he overstamped Spanish-American dollars. This was valid cash in this part of Derbyshire, but you had to spend it in Arkwright's establishments, like the pub. In some industrial villages, like Bourneville in Birmingham, alcohol was banned. But there was no such constraint in Cromford. It seems everyone drank ale, even the children who often consumed small beer. Small beer was lower in strength and actually safer to drink than the local water. And it was in the pubs like this one on North Street where workers could relax or maybe let off a bit of steam with a game like cudgelling. The idea of this was sort of dueling with sticks and you had to give your opponent a scar or a bloodied head, maybe break their skull, as if life wasn't hard enough. Sounds dangerous especially mixed with alcohol. And with the ale flowing freely, Arkwright needed to maintain discipline, so the factory owner also became a law enforcer. Cromford Lockup was the temporary holding place for local felons and drunks until they could be transferred to the nearest large town. As Lord of the Manor, this building was the responsibility of Richard Arkwright. He converted a cottage in the village into a small prison. I've come to take a look with Nell Darby, who's a crime historian. Now, what sort of person would find themselves in here? Well, it could be um, a thief, it could be a vagrant, basically anybody who'd done anything uh, to attract disapproval in the village could end up here for the night. Well, I'm the parish constable, I've got the key, so let's go in. Oh, my goodness. Have a look at this. Oh, wow. oh, it's a bit pokey in there, isn't it? Well, it is, but it's still got the original fixtures in there. You can see where the prisoners would have had a bed coming across that wall to sleep on. Is this sort of typical of the arrangement of lockups that were being built at the time? Well, they vary, actually, quite considerably, and this is actually quite a big one. You've got the separate cells, you've got a big room here with a fire and a grate. A lot of these lockups would actually just have been a tiny room with the door. Now, the Arkwrights are making statements with their buildings, left, right and centre, the workers' housing, pigsties even, the infrastructure that they're building here, but not with this lock-up. 
Well, no, and you can understand why, because these are prisoners. They're not going to be helping you, so why spend all this money on them? You do things on the cheap. You really try and just convert what you've got, spend the least amount of money, just so you've got somewhere to hold them. This is custody on the cheap. It is. It's spending as little money as possible. As the 19th century approached, cotton production wasn't the only industry in the village. Across Derbyshire, private entrepreneurs were determined to unlock the landscape's immense mineral wealth with mines, quarries and leadworks. Cromford was to play a part in a revolution in the way goods and raw materials were transported around the country. The Canal Age had arrived. This was Britain's civil engineering revolution. Canals like the Cromford carried goods and materials into the heart of the country, and that was great news for landlocked industrial settlements. Cromford became an important hub, with boats carrying limestone from the quarries and transporting coal to fuel the growing community. But one person stood in the canal engineer's way, Richard Arkwright. Hugh Potter is a local canal historian. Hugh, Arkwright was an industrialist, an innovator. He must have loved the canals. Well, I'm not sure he loved them. I think he had a, a mixed opinion of canals. The canal company needed him on board because he was the A-list celebrity of his day. And they needed his name to give the scheme credibility and to encourage people to invest in it. However, they soon lived to regret that. Why? What did he do? Well, no sooner had he agreed to support it, and he's hiring attorneys in London to oppose it, to bring in changes. He was insisting that they took the water from the River Derwent instead of the local watercourses, and that would have meant raising the weir, and that would have given him more power for his other mills. So he's got this new method of transport coming right to his industrial centre, but that's not enough. No, no, he wants to use it to improve the water supply. Indeed. Well, he's a businessman and he's looking for every opportunity to uh, make more money out of any local enterprise. On this occasion, the industrialist didn't get his own way. The canal engineers stuck to their original plan and his weir was never raised. But Arkwright made them pay dearly when the canal crossed his land. He was awarded over £1,500 in compensation, a small fortune back then. Arkwright died in 1792, aged 59, before the Cromford Canal was completed, and also before other projects like Willersley Castle and St Mary's Chapel here were finished. His son, Richard Arkwright Jr, took over the family business and completed the chapel which was founded by his father. Arkwright Sr was buried right here in the chancel of the family's private chapel. It's now the parish church. Richard Jr. was now in charge of the villagers. He encouraged his workers and their families to worship here. But there was another religious movement growing in the village and countrywide too, one that was not under his control. Non-conformists were breaking away from the Church of England and a national power struggle began to play out in places like Cromford. This was the rise of the Primitive Methodists, a denomination largely made up of miners and mill workers. Now, places like this were still under the thumb of powerful industrialists. Freedom to worship in the way they chose was one way that the population could assert some independence. The Prims were allowed to meet in the village, but Richard Arkwright Jr. wouldn't sell them land, so they worshipped in workers' homes and a meeting room before finding a site to build their new chapel. It was constructed on a small footprint, but this picture of a similar chapel shows how a gallery made best use of space to pack people in. And the building was designed to look like a house, so if it didn't work out, the primitive Methodists could sell it off. Dr Jill Barber has visited village chapels up and down the country. Jill, what distinguishes the primitive Methodists? 
Well, the primitive Methodists were working people who'd been marginalised by social change, like here in Cromford, the mill workers, where they'd been displaced from their communities, they'd lost their sense of identity, and they needed to find a new way of being and belonging. And that's what they found here in the chapels. By the early 20th century, the primitive Methodists had grown into a political movement. Through their preaching, they'd learnt leadership skills and how to hold a crowd. Trade unionism was born in chapels like the one at Cromford. And it was about making a noise. It wasn't just it a was. religion, it was changing society. It was, and that was the distinctive thing. You see, primitive Methodism gave working people a voice. That's the key thing. With absolutely no rights, who are empowered through the chapels to go out there and change the world. By the middle of the 19th century, Cromford's days as an industrial power were over. The mills began to close in the 1840s, but the time of Richard Junior's death in 1853, much of the family's fortune had been invested elsewhere, into banking, property and land. Cromford had lost its driving force, and its purpose. Now the cotton industry focused on Lancashire, which was much more conveniently situated for key coastal ports. After decades of cotton spinning, Cromford's mills fell silent and had to find new uses, from brewing beer to making paint to housing a laundry. These industries provided jobs in the village well into the 20th century, but the heyday was over. A natural floodplain and steep-sided cliffs limited development, and Cromford Village never grew into a town. Geology restricted its growth, and it remains a village today, its history fossilised in its form. The mills have been restored as a museum and business centre, and are now protected as part of a World Heritage Site. Today, this is still a thriving community, a village where tourism is an important trade and where locals celebrate their industrial heritage in a song that goes back to Richard Arkwright's day. The famous renowned cotton mills. What do you love about Cromford? Ben, apart from the beauty, it's the industrial heritage, it's the history, it's just wonderful. Look at it, it's just beautiful, living here in the Derbyshire Dales, and for me, it's just home. It's where I belong. Cromford, the famous renowned cotton mills. And it's not only in song that locals honour their past. Celebrating Cromford is officially open. Thank you. At the annual Celebrating Cromford Festival, villagers come together to pay tribute to the toil of the early inhabitants. It might be the locals in charge here today, but the memory of Richard Arkwright is still alive. His revolution changed the economy and the world. And it all started here, in the village he built to make it happen.